Benny boy. How are you? I survived, and how are you? Uh, I'm very glad that you have made it now. Yeah. There will be no connectivity issues. Yeah. I'm sure we are going to run smoothly. Yep. Yes. Um, yeah. Where were we? He had been sworn in. Yes. Oh, yes. Well, I just have to remind you that you are still under oath, the oath that you took yesterday to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing else but the truth, so help you God. Mr. Yes. Mr. July. Uh, sir, you, 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 in your affidavit that you have already confirmed that it is your affidavit, you are dealing with your 31 years experience as a cricket player, yep. and that you are currently unemployed. And your unemployment, you attribute it to the history that you are going to state in this forum. And that includes, amongst other things, the issue of the bet yeah. that you were accused of having stolen of Mr. Session Tendulkar. And you also state that in your early years, you used to travel from Kakhiso at the age of 14, coming to Wanderers to come and practice. And you also played for Soweto Club for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. So we want, this is an opportunity now to take us through your affidavit. Like I said, it's your experience. You don't have to read it. You can talk to it. Yeah. Yes, we've got your affidavit. Yeah. yeah. So as I was saying yesterday, um, for me, it was a lot of passion that I found, uh, whereby I felt like having played cricket, uh, it took me away from doing all these things that my friends would get up to uh, when I'm away playing cricket. Cricket is not like soccer. Soccer is like, what, for my age, it was like 30 minutes, 15 minutes aside. Then after 30 minutes, the game is done. Where I found that cricket, it's the whole day. Uh, so it was my passion. But after having, having said all that, uh, I, was, I was more passionate about uh, making friends with the white colleagues uh, my English became a bit better even when I got into class because I spent my whole day speaking English. So I found that even for my academic uh, stuff, it became better. So, um, yeah, uh, then it got to the racial issues now, whereby after practice, after I got selected for Gauteng, after practice I would see that the parents of the other guys are there. My parents would never get there. Or after uh, practice, guys get picked up and I would struggle getting home. And I couldn't phone my mom and say, Mom, I'm stuck here or what, what. I'm, I would have to make a plan to get into a public transport, which would sometimes, if it's 7 o'clock, uh, sometimes the taxis are done. And it, our practice would start at 5 o'clock. Uh, maybe half past 6, the, the, the practice would finish. So I would have 30 minutes to make sure I get to the taxis. So that was one of the, the things that I, I would struggle with. Uh, even if I get there, uh, when I get to Jobek, Jobek, the taxis are finished. Maybe I can get a taxi from Rosebank to Jobek, but when I get to Jobek, to Kakhiso, it would be a problem. So I would sometimes have to end up sleeping in a, in a tavern or a place like a, where, you know, at my age, I can say it, where ladies work at night. Uh, I don't know what you, am I allowed to mention that kind of stuff here? Am I allowed to mention that kind of stuff? Uh, we understand what yeah, you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, so uh, that would be the kind of circumstances uh, for my age I would end up in, uh, where I would sleep there uh, for comfort of, there's nowhere else to sleep, or I couldn't sleep in the, in the street. And they would know, nobody would understand it. And the next day, maybe we're traveling. 
uh, let's say we're traveling to, to go play in Devon, uh, I would just sleep there, brush my teeth from there where I slept, go back to the Wanderers, find all my teammates are waiting there with their parents, having their coffee or meal, come with Mama Gwenya there, have my Mama Gwenya there, and uh, maybe I'm five minutes late. Coach would have a full go at you and like, uh, they'll call you Mr. Latecomer. That would be another, this is prior to Mr. Stealing the Pet. This is Mr. Latecomer now. Mr. Latecomer, they would have to wait for you or tell you you're not gonna play. Before the, the game is even started, because you are late, you will be told that you never, you're not gonna play. So yeah, those are the kind of circumstances that I would have to go through, yeah. And it would, it would hurt, but it would get the best out of me. Me, when you tell me I'm not going to play because of this and this, uh, it will make me, from the practice, uh, or from the warm-up, I would want to do better because I know I've let myself down. I was late and the situation was beyond my control, but I'm here now. Let me show them what I can do. That's how I would uh, get turned on on playing the game. So, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, it, it was a, a nice long journey, but uh, it's well worth it when you get to sit in front of you guys and tell you guys about it. Uh, I wish there was a, a a question thrown at me so I can answer. I, I just no, yes, yeah, yeah, I was going I, to do I that. I just feel like I'm getting lost in between yeah, all this. I was <laughs> getting to that. Actually, there was a story that you started with yesterday, the story of a family in Kajeso, the white the white family. But maybe we'll talk about it later. Okay. But now you you go to Soweto, you play there from 19... Oh, yeah. The 10 years. Yeah. Which is 1978? 78? I was no, a little no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, 1980... No, I, play, I played in, in the 90s. Uh, it's 90s yes. when I played. Oh, 1998. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. 1998 until yes. 2008. Yeah. Yes. So after playing the for Soweto club, then what what happened to you? Okay, um, what had happened was uh, Mr. Kaya Majola uh, came and took Soweto Cricket Club to another level. And he wanted me to be a big part of that because prior to that, I was playing for uh, Koza Cricket Club, which is in Krugersdorp. It's uh, only... Uh, the Afrikaner-speaking guys. That's where I used to play. So Kaya came to me and said, why don't you come and play with your brothers? Uh, because I used to complain that uh, these guys, after the game, they dropped me off there and me now I want to play cricket professionally. After the game, there's a lot of drinking that happens and re, 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 re. I complained to Kaya and he said, no, man, come and play with your brothers. And Because I had this thing about being a, a West Indian. I, I enjoyed watching West Indian players. Mm -hmm. Brian Charles, Lara, and all that. At that time, West Indies were doing very, very well. Mm -hmm. So they are one of the few teams that maybe if I'm watching cricket, I see them playing, I'll sit there and say, yeah, this is how I want to play cricket. So Mr. Kaya Majola created a situation where we could create our own West Indies in our heads. Mm -hmm. So he invited me to come and play for Sueto because he's heard about me. And when he saw me play, he thought, yes, sir. He might be crazy, but he can play this game. So, yeah, I went to play for Soweto and things started looking bright uh, because Soweto started touring. I think they toured England. Uh, we toured a place called, uh, what's that, Fort Bofol. Yeah, so I, I, I got to know a bit of the roots of Tosa's people because Tosa wasn't my thing. I mean, I, I'm, originally I'm Sotho. Uh, I speak Sutu and Tswana. So, Tosa people, rugby and cricket, they're quite good at it. And me, soccer, it's our thing. So, then Mr. Majola invited me to go to Fort Bofol to go learn about uh, the game a bit more. And so, we went to Cricket Club, we went there, we played, then we became a little union of, uh, yeah, we can play this game. And that's when I started having a full belief that you know what, one day I'm going to play for South Africa from playing for Soweto Cricket Club. But when I was playing for Koza uh, Cricket Club, it was more like, yeah, uh, 
uh, as a coach there in our team. That was more like it. But uh, when I was playing for Soweto Cricket Club, I felt like I belonged. And uh, Kaya was a big influence in doing that because I wasn't short of anything. When I was playing for Koza, I would have to borrow people's stuff, uh, like a bet. They would have a, a, a specific number that I bet at. I would bet maybe number seven after all the other guys that can bet have bet it because I didn't have my own kit. So that was the reason that they told me that I can't bet up front. I'm an opener, but I'm not going to open because I don't have my own kit. I'm using somebody else's kit. So that person must bet first uh, so I can use their kit after. Yeah. I'm an all rounder. I'm an open yeah, I'm a batsman leg spinner. Okay. And a super fielder. Okay. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> so you then state that whilst you were playing for Soweto Cricket Club, you were also in two thousand and two selected as a player of the year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I had a good season. That was a very good season for me and as I said, it was through all through the, the influence of, I've never played in a situation where I just had to play cricket. Mm. Uh, that was the first time I had to play under that them circumstances, mm. which was created by by Kaya, and I think uh, it was Kaya and Nils Momberg and Doctor, what was Doctor Nyoka? Mm. Yeah, it's okay. Doctor Nyoka, if I can remember. Mm. So that group of uh, people that were managing Soweto. Uh, created a, a environment where you just want to do well. And we, we did do well. And for me, it, 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 it got me playing cricket at the best of my ability because there was no reason for me to be late uh, because they had arranged transport to pick me up from home. Uh, they had arranged, I think, with Nike then, who we were sponsored by Nike, to get us kit. Everybody had their own kit. And if you play well, after the game, you get given a, maybe you take five wickets, you get given a, a shoes. If uh, you, you score 100, you get given shoes. So there was a, a thing of, yes, yes you want to do well. If it's your turn to do well, you want to do well, so you can have nice shoes. So we, we did do well during that process of uh, playing for Kaya. We, we did. Then there were warm-up games leading to the World Cup that you played in Kenya, Pakistan, and New Zealand. Yeah, uh, it was. I think it was the first World Cup mm. uh, South Africa has ever had to host. Mm. So I got selected to go play against uh, New Zealand, and funny enough, straight from school, I had to go play, uh, face this guy Shane Bond, and I think he had just. Come for New Zealand has just come from uh, Australia, and Shane Bond had, I think he had been selected to, no, he had won a uh, player of the series, New Zealand against Australia, and he was bowling really quick. I gotta say, uh, that's the quickest bowl I've faced so far. Then, uh, straight from school, I went to Elka Stadium. I had forgotten my kit, and I had forgotten my, my ball box and I had to go face this New Zealand fast bowler without a ball box. So I thought, you know what, after playing against this guy, if I get hit here, I'm never going to even have kids. So yeah, that's one thing I remember that I was, I forgot my, my, my kit and uh, the ball box and all that. And I tried telling one of the guys that, you know what, I'm from school and I forgot this. And they said, you know what, it's either you're going to play or you must just forget about playing cricket. So uh, the, the coach then, I think it was, I forgot this guy's name. He told me that I have to go face, I must just put on a, a, a glove and go and bet. And I was uh, playing against an international player. So there was no plan made for me to try and get a proper box. I was told, hey, Baba, get a lap. And that's why that was, what it had to happen. Mm -hmm. So I got it over and done with. Yeah. And I think I got 22 runs that game. Yes. Uh, but uh, yeah. Then there was now the story of the Indian national team touring South Africa. Yeah, the main story. <laughs> Can you talk about that story? Yeah, okay. This is 
uh, Sachin Tenduka's last tour as a player in South Africa. And here I am excited that uh, I'm going to see Sachin. And uh, we go on bowl to the Indian, the Indian team at the Wanderers. And uh, a friend of mine called Tumisa Makalima, I think he had just come back from India. Uh, he was at the Plascon Academy. And I lived next to uh, where the Plascon Academy was in uh, Melville. Um, I lived with a guy called Suraj Kondrat. Then uh, we meet in Tumisa. Hey, how's it in China? What, 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 what? Hey, I'm back, I'm back. What, what did you bring back for me? I've got a bed for you. Uh, then it had a shape like uh, uh, the Indian beds. They've got this curving thing about them. So I called that bed Sashin. And I was betting so well, everybody in Soweto knew this bed as Sashin. So somehow we go to Limpopo with uh, my coach then was Lawrence Mahatlani, mm. who I think now he's no longer the South African under 19 coach. He's, I think he's coaching somebody else, a, a national team somewhere in Africa. He's no longer coaching South Africa. His name is Lawrence Mahatla, and we go to Limpopo. We play at Limpopo, and his phone rings. I'm in a, I'm in a field. Uh, as a coach, he calls me, say, hey, come, 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 come. The CEO wants to talk to you, which is Alan Kuri. Uh, OK, I'm wearing my whites. I come out of the field. Then this guy started shouting at me to say that, effing hey, what, what, effing what, what, effing what, what. You better effing bring that bloody bed, effing what, what. And I'm thinking, what is going on? Then I give Lawrence a phone and say, who's this? He says, no, uh, speak, it's the CEO. I'm like, CEO, this guy is swearing at me. What is he talking about? He says, you must uh, effing bring the bed, what, what, what. I'm still, I can't believe what's going on. I'm, Give him the phone, I drop it, I say, why is this guy swearing at me? And he phones back and say, Effin, this bed has to be back in Jobek right now. You are going to get back to Jobek now now with that bed. Effin, 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 this. So basically I was accused of stealing Sachin's bed and it had nothing to do with me. So whoever who told him that I took the bed, I don't know who it is. Then I stood there for about five minutes, I cried. And my coach, who was Lawrence Mahatlani, he, he didn't have anything to say to me as a young boy. And all my team, uh, I was 17. I was 17 and I, I was full of tears. I can remember like it was yesterday. That, that memory <clears throat> will never go out of my head because I was playing the game that I enjoy. And the bet, the reason that I called that bet Sachin was, Sachin was my favorite batsman. Uh, because when he bet it, he bet it forever. If you don't get him out, good luck on getting him out. And I call I call that bet Sachin because of the caving, and Dumisa Makalima gave me that bet. So there was no way I would have stolen Sachin's bet. I would have actually rather asked him before I go bull to him, say, say, if I get you out, maybe can you give me your bet? Or I'll have a bet with him or something like that. I wouldn't have, I, I wasn't taught how, uh, to steal. Stealing, I, I don't think uh, the way I was brought up was one of the main things. You don't steal, you ask nicely and you receive. That's how I was brought up. So this uh, Mr. Alan Kuri swear at me for, to me it was like forever. And yeah, he told me I'll never play cricket, he'll terminate my contract. Uh, he said all these horrible things and I cried. I cried even today when I think about it, it just makes me feel like, wow. It's happening right now. So, yeah. Um, then Who were you playing for? Which club? I was playing for Gauteng. Okay. Yeah, it, it, we, we, there was a Gauteng a senior. Then we had B team. Then I was playing for the Colts. The Colts is the team that you play for during the off season. Mm. If you do it in the Colts, you play for the B team. Then you, you get sent into playing for the A team. So I was basically a, a contracted Gauteng Junior, I was I had a junior contract with Gauteng. So he said to me he will terminate my contract if I don't if and bring this bet and rah, 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 rah. So that's how I got accused of stealing Sachin to do his bet, which I never did steal. And then what happened to the did you get to know what happened to the bet? 
Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. All I know is from there, I know that I, I'm not going to have a contract. I started uh, organizing myself to go to England. Uh, I started phoning around uh, to get my ready to uh, get myself ready to go to England because I knew that uh, they, I had no chance of playing for Gauteng because I'm this uh, I'm this guy that stole Sachin Tenduka's bat. And coming back from Gauteng from that day, uh, playing cricket was a nightmare because the, the guys that we're playing against teased me throughout because uh, even the coach had to explain to the guys that uh, this guy is take that thing just spread like a like a disease mm. uh, even friends of mine from Devon or uh, from Northwest they knew about it everybody knew about this that uh, Sunny Boy Litsile has stolen Sachin Tenduka's bed whatever province I went to play in, they'll look at me and say oh this is the guy that stole Sachin Sachin Tenduka's bat. So it was like, a, yeah, it was a, like a, something that you don't want to be part of, especially if you didn't do it. So everybody just in, because cricket is a small little, it's not like uh, other sports, I don't know. Cricketers, we know each other, even if it's in South Africa, but uh, it's like a little ball of people that know each other. So if somebody does something, it, it, it goes around Quickly, so that's how how quickly it went around for people to know that uh, apparently I've stolen Sachin Tenduka's bat, even if I didn't. Because mm. I, I remember even one of the parents, as a as a coach, uh, not so long ago, uh, he asked me about, hey, can you please tell me about this story of you taking Sachin Ten? This guy I don't I haven't known for long, but he knew about this thing that. Uh, uh, I had stolen Sachin Tenduka's bat, and that's how quickly things uh, fly around in cricket. And nothing was ever done about it. Uh, nobody has ever told me who really st stole the bat or how did it come about that I got accused of it. But for me, it made sense that I used to call my bat Sachin. So I would have thought that's why they thought I took Sachin's bat. But before India came, I had called that bat Sachin. It was my bat that I had called Sachin. So it didn't make sense for them to tell the guy that I took the bat, which I never did. So you don't know whether the bat was ever found? No. Nope. You don't know whether the person who actually stole the bat was no. found? No. Okay. And nobody ever bothered uh, to tell me what really happened. All I know is... Alan Kuri phoned me during the game and had a full go at me. I mean, full, 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 full go. Don't worry. Maybe the way I'm telling you guys is uh, he had a full go. For mm. it takes it takes a lot for somebody to make me cry. Mm. I mean, as Sunny Boy, I'm a, I'm a bubbly person. Nothing will will ever really get to me. But that day, I just cried like a little baby. And so, then yeah. you say in paragraph 14. This still haunts me until today. Uh, and I, I have, let me read it. Yeah. And I have faced many tribulations because of the racial targeting visited upon me by the Mr. Allen Gore. I was I chose number one purely because of the color of skin. So when you say this, were there other players? where you were when the Tandulka belt got lost? Uh, basically, what happens is when, when, when a national team comes up uh, uh, to South Africa, uh, they get all these uh, black players mostly to come and uh, bowl to the touring team. We're like, uh, for me, we're like uh, bowling machines. Yeah, you get given... Uh, uh, transport money after you bowl to. But for me, it was like to test myself whether I'm good enough to, uh, it was like an honor because, uh, but for them, it was like, it's in the system. You get an international team coming over and we'll have uh, the boys from the township uh, to miss school, some to miss university to come and bowl at these guys. and. The, the payment that you get is being accused of something like that, uh, that you have stolen something. Mm -hmm. And like 
yeah. I mean, for me, I, I was a contracted provincial player. Mm. Let's say we're playing against Western Province. Western Province, they fly up, they get into a taxi, they go into their hotel, they have to come and uh, practice at the Wanderers because we will be playing against them. Me as a provincial player coming to play against these guys, they find me uh, pulling uh, the covers there. I'm now a, a, a provincial player who is a groundsman. Uh, I must run quickly down to go get drinks for the other players that I'm going to play against. So it was like a, a, a slap in the face. Do you understand? My teammates don't get to pull the covers, but me, I must go pull uh, bloody covers every time I ask them. Why am I getting? Uh, why am I a provincial player? But I'm I'm getting to go pull p covers. I must go get other players uh, drinks. Like I was a little slave, La Payan, and there was nobody to tell. After Kaya Machola died, all these things started happening. Like Abu Jimmy Kuku, they will just make you feel like you are nothing. I'm a contracted player, but I must go pull covers with the ground ground people. When the other team when they practice up there, I must go pick up drinks and go give my opponents that I'm going to play against uh, bloody drinks. So, yeah, those are some of the things that I, I remember that really, yeah, it wasn't nice. It wasn't nice. Uh, but I'm a player. I'm, 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 I'm supposed to practice with my teammates. Hey, go get drinks downstairs for the other team and for our teammates. So, yeah, they, they really... If I may ask, were you the, the only player, like, you know, with this example you're giving, that would be told to go get drinks? Or would no, it was me and Walter. Walter Masimola. Mm. Uh, Walter Masimola passed away overseas. That's the guy that helped me to go overseas. Uh, yeah, me and Walter. But Walter, when I speak to Walter about it, he just tell me, you know what, just get it over and done with uh, because he, he was something else. I mean, uh, he was my, like my mentor. Mm. So the person that would do that, I, I don't think they really, I would never see Jeff doing it because they were a bit scared. They would pick on certain people. Like uh, Solomon Dima, uh, I think he, he also got into a situation where he was accused of stealing something. And I know he didn't do that for sure, because he didn't have a reason to do that, because he had his own sponsorship. Uh, so what they did with uh, me, Soli, Walter, Johnson, Mafa, if one is playing on the A team, the two will be playing in the B team, then the other will compete for the same position, all of us. We, we, you wouldn't get chosen on merit. You just had to have what, that one player that would go with the A team, and he'll play, then the two, if they do well, he would get dropped, then they'll take one up. So that's, that's, how, that's how the system was. One would play, one would sit out. And we were all contracted. Contract means that you, you, if you got a chance from where you are to go play for South Africa, but they wouldn't let that happen. Uh, every time I ask, why don't I play? They say, no, uh, Clive XDN has got one more season. This was for about five years. Every every year, they say, no, he's got one more season to go. One more season to go. So that's, there was nobody to speak on our behalf, basically. After Kaya died, nobody could speak on our behalf. So we were just dragged around left to right. So you counted these four players, and they so happened that all the four are black players. Yeah. So this thing of picking up or giving water to your opponents. Do you, or in your view, is it something that was designed only for black players? It's, 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 you never hear of anything like that, where a provincial player is gonna play against other, another provincial, I mean, we played against Western Province. Mm. They've got their own team. I won't go there and they say, hey, JP Tumini, go get the, uh, uh, the Gauteng players, uh, 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 water. Uh, go run quickly, the covers. Uh, so basically from the morning, I would, I would work as a, as a groundsman. If I want to go hit balls, they say, no, there's covers or there's rain. You have to, I must run, stop hitting balls 
and go uh, uh, push covers. That is, that, uh, uh, what's the right word? I'm looking for humiliation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is, it's either I'm doing that or they scrap your contract. That's how uh, Alin Kuri started, like, yeah, showing me that he's the boss. Mm. Yeah. And then now you are too. Oh, oh sorry. So I just want to understand again, who, like, who would say to you, like, go pull the covers or go get the drinks? Would it be other players or Not would it be... Players. Would, Not would the players. It, it wasn't the players. Uh, the, the thing was, it was like somebody was told that uh, I'm going to be... They are teaching me how to be a groundsman uh, while I'm playing cricket. Uh, so everything that needs to be down in the ground, uh, they must just call me. Uh, they said to Ubutelezi. Ubutelezi was the, the heads of grounds, ground people for the black guys. The, there was a main guy, uh, the groundsman, then he had people that worked for him. So whoever who worked for him would have to call somebody to go call me. If I'm not coaching, if I'm not playing cricket or I'm not uh, practicing cricket, I need to uh, be helping the ground staff because I get paid. That's what I was told. Now, you then leave 2004, mm -hmm. you go to England because you were told that your future to play cricket in South Africa, it's no more. Mm -hmm. um, so what can you talk about your story when you get to England? Yeah, well, I got to England in, um, I think in one of the tours, um, South Africa came while I was that side, and um, I was having such a great time in England, but it just didn't feel right. Uh, you get homesick, and you, you just want to tell your family what's going on. Mm -hmm. But my, 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 what it is with my family, they're not cricket people. They're like uh, they're just happy that I'm doing something with my cricketing thing. So I didn't know I, I was. Um, I had stress i don't know what is stress uh, like for me i'm gonna i'm gonna make it i'm gonna i'm gonna make it i'm gonna make it so at one at one point uh, i tried taking my life uh, because i had been in england for quite a while and things weren't working out and there's nobody to to talk to about certain things that uh, for a young boy i didn't think i had stress i just knew that i was uh, faced with an obstacle in front of me, and I didn't know what to do with it. So I tried taking my life, and when I got to the hospital, the doctor said I was lucky, an inch either way, I would have been dead. So I need to try and speak to people about my, my, my stress. And she organized that I speak to people, and uh, yeah, that is how I knew that I had stress. Because when I started talking and they said, this is a lot of stuff that you're going through. You need to try and talk to people. There's people uh, uh, with a lot of things in their shoulders. It's called stress. Rah, 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 rah. So that's when I realized that, you know what, uh, I should have actually tried speaking to other people about what's, what's going on in deep inside my heart. Because uh, it's a bit too much to take. So in paragraph 15, you say, even during my England playing career, the Tendulka bat incident would be raised jokingly by fellow players, and yeah. it would hurt me every time it is raised. While in England, I even tried to take my life because I couldn't bear the pain of the humiliation, abandonment, defamation of character, and the shame of something that I did not even do. So what happens is in England to go play club cricket, a lot of cricketers in South Africa during off season, like now, I would be in England if the, the so in April, it starts in April, May, going to September, a lot of cricketers leave South Africa to go play there. So one of the, the, the guys that played for another club. He was from South Africa. And I thought I had left that stealing the bad thing behind. But the guy that was playing for another club, 
So after, after, after the game, we would have a drink and whatever. Somehow, he knew how to chap me because I was chapping him. Hey, what, 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 you know how cricketers come hard at each other. But somehow, he, he managed to bring that one up. Uh, are you, are you going to steal somebody's bet while you're here as well, like you stole Sachin's bet? So I was like, wow. That was a good chap, but I thought I had left that behind. So that's how it, it came over there. That's what I'm saying. In a cricket uh, circle, things fly around. Now it started going around that I had, uh, then your teammates will ask you, hey, did you steal Sachin's bet? Then it becomes something like that, that you were trying to run away from while you were at home. Uh, going to start afresh, and it follows you all the way to England. That's how it came about there. Yeah. And then you say you lost a sense of direction yep. in your life. Yep. And you suffered from depression. You've already explained that. Then now you also talk about the unemployment. Now you have stopped playing. You are no longer playing. You talk about you being unemployed and you make applications. And you make a point that being one of the best players that South Africa ever had, you can't even find a job. And wh why? Why can't you find a job? Well, it goes back to that same old thing. Uh, they like uh, have a stigma on you, like uh, oh, the sunny boy. Sunny boy, it's, it, it goes back to that, especially when you get told uh, that you have to go try find something, uh, uh, like uh, you have to try and find a way of making a living, you have to go pack boxes. You get told by people that know your potential. I'm not gonna mention names, but there's people that, I mean, my son, what scares me mostly is my son. My son is a very passionate cricketer, I can't get him into a cricketing school. I can't get him anywhere. Uh, I can't get a job myself because of uh, my past, I, I would say that. I've been given uh, a, a, a runaround about how I'm supposed to go pack boxes. Imagine somebody that knows your potential uh, as a cricketer, that knows where you've been with cricket, telling you you must uh, go pack boxes. Uh, it's like they, 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 they're saying shove your talent down the drain and go pack boxes. So, and these are the same people that know what you've been through, uh, that know the only thing that you know that you love is cricket. Those are the same people that are telling you that. And these are the people that are supposed to help you through whatever you're going through or help you uh, to get somewhere with your life because you got kids now. It's no longer about your playing career. It's no longer, uh, they've, taking me to all these fine, I mean, Terry Jenner uh, was Shane Wan's coach. Uh, South African flew Terry Jenner from Australia to come and coach me, Paul Adams, uh, Justin Ong Tong. They, they chose, I think, Matthew Hill. I think they chose about uh, eight spinners all over the country to go to Centurion to go stay with this guy, uh, Terry Jenner, who was uh, Shane Wan's coach. I've got so much to offer in this game. I've got so much experience. I've got so much that I can do to, um, uh, to the community. I mean, cricket in itself, with what's going on in South Africa now. Kids are always in corners. Kids are up to no good. Cricket, what it done for me, I think it can do that for other kids. I mean, if you, you play cricket, you don't have time to be messing around. Cricket is a whole day sport. It teaches you morals. It teaches you lots of things. So I, I, I don't see why can't I give back all that, uh, that experience, all that uh, thing that, I've, that cricket has given me. Why can't I give that back? I, it just doesn't make any sense. But uh, uh, that's, another, that's a story for another day. But basically, um, I don't want another kid to go through what I went through. Basically, uh, I don't want another kid to go through what I went through with... Uh, where you've been accused of something that you didn't do. Yeah. So you, you, you also say in your affidavit, you want this chapter about Tendulkar's belt be closed. How do you suggest that this, uh, the ombuds, 
can address the issue of the belt, the bet that you were accused of, that it must be closed? Yeah, it is. It's. Uh, it, it goes back to where it, it must go back to where it belongs. Uh, I've never stolen anything in my life. I, I'm, I will never do anything. I, I, I want the person that said I did that to own up that I didn't do it and apologize. And uh, me, I need to uh, try and get something to do to the community, to give back to the community, uh, whereby we there's a lot of sunny boiled sealers out there that need to be uh, guided through uh, life. I mean, there's so many opportunities that cr uh, cricket uh, uh, creates, uh, but because of our uh, our parents themselves, our parents do not uh, follow up on cricket that much. So our kids end up, I mean, my first contract, I remember, I signed the contract, my parents went there, I didn't have a lawyer, even today, I don't know anything about signing contracts. And I'm not the only, I'm believing me, there's a kid right now that's signed a, a provincial contract that he doesn't know. And there's a kid that's playing in the same same field. Like I, I played with Graham Smith in the same field, but his, his contract and mine were two different contracts because his dad was there to show him or, or to speak on his behalf. Me, I was just happy. Oh, I'm playing for Gauteng. I sign, I don't know what I've signed. So there is so much that is out there for me to do, but I've not been given an opportunity to do that because of what? Sachin Tenduga's bet. You then say, I cannot qualify for any senior cricket job. Did you try to get a senior uh, cricket yeah. job? Yeah, I've, uh, I've, uh, I've handed in my... my um, CV to Gauteng, I'm still waiting. They, they, all these these things that I've done, they said uh, they're waiting for the COVID to go off. So, yeah. Sunny Boy? There's a, there's a part up Dwam, where you say, um, I went to England from 2004 until 2009 to try and play there because I was told I would never play for South Africa. I must just forget it. So where does that come from? Um, who told you that? Alan Kuri. Alan Kuri told me that. Uh, that's when uh, I just decided to go live there. Because uh, if a CEO tells you that, you must know that's it. And it's not only he's telling you that. He can tell other provinces as well. If you try and maybe go to play for the Dolphins, it's, it's not going to work. Because the CEOs of each province know each other. So it was Alan Kuri that the same guy that accused me of taking the bet is the same guy that told me that I would never play cricket and he'll make sure that I'll never play cricket for South Africa. Mm. And did you ever get a chance to sit down with him after the phone call to, to discuss um, the allegation against you? No, I, I did sit down and not sit down. Like I just went there to go, to go show him the bet that I used to call Sashin. He, I did go back. I showed him the bet that uh, uh, I called Sashin, and I had to explain to him, this is the bet that I called Sashin. This is not Sashin Tenduka's bet. Mm. They took my bet and go and show it to Sashin Tenduka, and Sashin looked at the bet and he said, that's not his bet. Then they brought the bet back to me. So that was, uh, that was for my side, that was my bet, and yeah. Mm. And for them to, to, to tell me I'm no longer going to play for South Africa because of something that I didn't do is still a puzzle on my life. But you could also say it's because of the color of my skin. That's why this was taken like that. Yeah. And, and then where were you in terms of, of your career? Firstly, let me just ask, with this incident of, of the bat, which year was that? Sheesh. Ooh, I think it was it was I was I was about what I was about 18 18 so 22 it was 2000 and I think it was around 2011 
or 2009. It was prior to the World Cup, the football World Cup. Oh. Is it? Because hmm? you said that you went to England from 2004 until 2009. So obviously it would have been before 2004. Before, yeah. Yeah, it, was, it would have been before, yeah. It would have been before 2004, right? Yeah, it would have been 2000, I think. Okay, yeah. it would have been around 2000. Yeah. Okay, and, and where were you with your career at that stage? Like, what, what were the prospects for you, like, Whoa. at that stage, like, um, prior to the incident? Like, where yeah. were you and, like, you know, what, what sort of hopes did you have at that time? No, I think uh, for me, it was, um, yeah, I was... I was in my prime, like being she, I just, I was fearless. Uh, I just couldn't wait to, with the ball in my hand, with the bat, I was just fearless. I was, I was ready to take on the world. So for me, that's why I'll always remember that as, as a ga ga game breaker, you know, because I was, ooh. Well, when I look back, yeah, that was my time. Yeah, I was, uh, I was a hot berry berry. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, being cheese. Mm. So it was bad timing for for my life for that to happen at that time. Mm. Yeah, uh, when I look back, yeah, I was I was at the top of my game. I was at the top of my game, young boy, uh, fearless. Yeah, no, I was at the top of my game when that happened. Okay, and and then what informed your decision to? come back to South, South Africa from, from England? Uh, well, when I got there, because uh, I, I was, I was going to try and live there because I saw the situation with Kevin Peterson. So I thought I could do a uh, Kevin Peterson myself, end up staying there, end up playing for England. Then uh, I, got, uh, I got a son. I got a son in... Uh, it didn't work up with his mom, uh, so it made things even worse. I thought I would get married there, <laughs> get papers, because all the West Indian guys that I played with, they said to me, that's what I must do. I, was try, I must try and get married that side. Then I'll get the, the paperwork. Then I'll probably try and play for England. And that didn't happen because uh, me and my baby mama did, uh, didn't work out. So, yeah. It was never, I don't know why is it so difficult for, for us as black players to go overseas and get all these things done. But it's the other way around for the white guys. It's like my teammate Michael Lum played for England. Grant Elliott went to go play for New Zealand. There's a, another guy that I know is playing for New Zealand now. So I don't know for so-called black players, will that ever happen? Can Rabada leave South Africa and go play for England? I don't know whether I can. Well, I tried. That was my mission. I was going to go do that. So it didn't happen. And I had to drag myself back to South Africa because my uh, playing working visa had run out. Mm -hmm. okay. And I was never going to be able to go back as a, as a professional cricketer because I had lost my contract with uh, Gauteng. So... I went there as a, as a professional cricketer. So me going back again, I wasn't going to go as a professional cricketer. I was going to go maybe as a, as a, I don't know, as a father. Yeah. Okay. So you, you, you never played for Proteus? Nope. And what do you think the reason for that? Oh, well, uh, as I said, the stigma, yeah, that stigma will, will always haunt me. Mm. That, that stigma will, because uh, I, I watched every game of the Proteas, believe you me. I never played in person, but every game I was there, like test match or whatever. Mm. Even when they, came to, when they came to England, sometimes after the game, I remember Mackie Makaya uh, bought me tickets and Paul Adams. I was watching the game with um, Lucas Khadeb at Leeds. Then after the game, we went to the, to the hotel. It was so nice. Even Grand Smith, they saw me there and they asked me how things, yeah, yeah. But the, the question is, why can't I play 
for South Africa. That's what you're asking me. Mm -hmm. uh, I stole Sachin Tinduka's bat. I'll mm -hmm. still say that, mm -hmm. which I never did. So you, you in, in your view, when you were playing for England, you should have been considered for playing for South Africa. Yeah. For me, I was good enough to play for South Africa. Mm. Yeah. And then you, um, you then say, I do not want to make enemies out of my testimony in this process, but I hope that my testimony would be taken in a positive light. I hope CSA will take great strides to correcting their mistakes and making things right. What mistakes are you referring to there? That's uh, CSA. Mm. Uh, I would say contracts. 11 players in the field should, everything should be playing. I mean, I'm not the only person that's complaining about this. Our contracts and the white players' contracts is two different things, but we play in the same field. So uh, everything must be, I mean, we're all individuals. We all have, uh, we want to, we all want nice things in life. Uh, we all want to uh, be treated the same. Uh, whereby playing for South Africa or playing provincial cricket or playing mini cricket, everything must be level for everybody. It can't be because uh, you are in a, in a certain skin, you must be treated in a certain way. No, no, no. It should be level. Everybody, when they walk in the field, you must know level, not because of uh, the color of your skin. Uh, you must get a, a better contract or you must be treated any different from the uh, your colleague. So, yeah. I, you know, in paragraph 14 of your affidavit, you say even after they discovered that I did not steal the bet, and that the bet was actually never stolen. No one ever came back to me to apologize until this day. And I just want to, to find out from you, how do you know that it was discovered that you had not stolen the bet? Or let me ask the first question. For people who are accusing you of theft, of a, a bed belonging to a player who had visited the country, was there ever any formal disciplinary hearing where it was shown that, in fact, you were the thief or was just was this something that just perpetuated as a stigma from the day that Alan Curry had accused you of stealing the bet? Basically, after he had found, we were playing at, uh, at Limpopo. So as we got back, uh, the first thing first, I was taken straight into his office. That bed that I used to call Sashin got taken to him, and I left it there. Then they said they're going to take it to Sashin. Yeah, that was your bed. Yeah, the one that I used to call Sashin. Mm -hmm. That I got given by to me, some Kalim. Mm -hmm. So they took the bed to him, and the next day, uh, and when, as I gave him the bed, I remember he said, you better hope this is not Sachin's bet. And that I will never forget. He said, you better hope. And I knew it wasn't Sachin's bet, so I gave it. Then um, I think the next day, I uh, got given the bet back, and that was the last of it. And he told me, no, this is not Sachin's bet. Uh, 
Lawrence. Who gave you back the bet? Uh, my, my former coach, Lawrence Maatlani. Mm. Yeah. He says, no, they say this is not Sachin's bet. So. And, and Alan Curry? Alan Curry, uh, the CEO. He, yes. he He's the one who had confronted you. Yeah. And had said you'd better hope that this does not turn out to be Sachin's bet. Yeah. Mm hmm. And uh, that was pretty much uh, the, the, the least of my problem was he, that was done. And I got my bet back and that was it. I, I never spoken to him again about the bet or anything. I never went to him and said, yeah, now, now what? Mm. Uh, are you going to apologize or anything? And that was it. But he also never came back to you and said, look, nope. I'm sorry. Nope. Nope. Okay. Mm. Now, when you say contracts for black players were different from contracts for white players, how do you know this? Uh, well, it's uh, it's it's what it is because. When I signed the contract, uh, my contract was basically to cover where, because I'm a contracted player, they had to uh, make sure that me, Johnson, and Jeffrey Toyani were moving, were moved to Lindest. Uh, it's a three bedroom flat, which isn't that far from the Wanderers because I lived far. I live in Kruisdorp. Mm. So they got me and Johnson, uh, Jeffrey, to live in the same uh, townhouse. Jeff had a car, Johnson had a car. So for me, I was always going to get a lift with one of them. If Jeff is playing in the A team, Johnson is playing in the B team, I'll live with Jeff, uh, with Johnson. If the other way around, I'll live with whoever who's in my team at that, that, that particular day. So when they give you a contract, they give you a contract. In your contract, the amount of money that you get, you're gonna pay. Uh, they're gonna deduct money to pay for where you where you stay accommodation. and accommodation. Mm. Then there was a bit of food as well. Uh, they would take some money and they, they'll buy me food. Then I'll pick it up from the office. Then uh, whatever I have left is basically to cover my 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 transport. Yes, I understand that. Yeah. But how do you know that it was different from the contracts that the white players got? I know that. <laughs> we, we we used to have a, we used to have a talk about the, the contracts as players. Uh, the black players we knew our contracts were were, were not the same as the white players. Uh, I, I, can't I don't disbelieve you. you, but you know, I want to know if you know for a fact or if it is something that you suspected no i know i know so. for a fact I, I, I could I, I couldn't have the same contract as a as a white player we know that how do you know it mm. okay they they will never be i will never get the same contract as as, as a white player that i know but i can't i can't state the fact that i've I watched his contract his contract is is uh, is is the same as mine that we know that their contracts are, are better than ours. Mm -hmm. And I, I know it, it sounds like I'm con contradicting myself here, but mm -hmm. uh, you can go around the country. We, we all know that their contracts are better than yeah, ours. Well, some other people have said that. Yeah. I just wanted to know, because you have now given us an affidavit and where you make this allegation. Yeah. I just wanted to be sure. No, uh, that, um, uh, it, it, we're always told not to talk about contracts. Mm. Uh, they made sure that we, we do not talk about contracts, even amongst ourselves mm. uh, as black cricketers. Like my contract and Jeffrey Toyani's as a senior of mine will not be the same. Mm. He was a senior to me, uh, but they wouldn't allow him to tell me about how, it's, I don't know, they, they just play a game of chairs with it, those kind of things. Mm. Uh, and if I was to ask or if I was to tell somebody about my contract, I would probably be promised that you'll get into trouble. But it's, a, it's something that's, 
when you sit back and look at it, you think, yeah, okay, yeah, I was played. When you get all the certain things, you, you think about them, you think, oh, okay, this is what was going on. Would you have an idea of how much or how you lost financially because of the payments that you got compared with what you think you should have got. Let's say, for instance, if all players, black and white, Indian colored, were given the same salaries for the same performances or for the same rank or the same uh, qualifications that they had. Do you have a sense of how much, if you had been paid properly, you should have got? I know Mary, perhaps it, will, it would be something where you would have to do a calculation. But do you have a sense? Or let me start by asking, how much did you get at the time that you were a contracted player? How were you paid? Oh, well, my contract, I was getting 3.5 uh, as a provincial player. Pay what? Per month. Per month, yes. 3.5. And uh, the other guys, I know that um, at one point, one guy, he slipped and he said he was getting about 24. As I said, he said he's getting 24 and I looked at him and I was like, what? How do you end up with that? But, uh, and he was just a junior. So mm. uh, there, there was a huge, huge difference. Huge, mm. huge. But you can't force somebody to say, hey, Baba, I want to see you. Can we compare? But I'm sure if if they if you can go back to all these things that I'm saying, yeah. then there are there are records there. There are records that say who was getting how much, who was getting. Yeah. I us we were there, there at the bottom just to uh, for your taxi. Every time you carry that bag up, the wanderers go to the taxis. Uh, your, t your your teammates drive past you. Beep 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 beep. <laughs> that is all I know. Mm. You know. Um, even today, it hurts me when I go past the Wanderers and think I'm still walking, eh? and uh, I'm going to coach or going to find a job. People are driving past you. This is this is my journey. Mm. So I know we we are we are done. We are badly done. Uh, it, it 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 shouldn't it shouldn't be like this. We shouldn't be having this talk. Mm. I should even if I didn't play for South Africa, but I shouldn't have this thing that I'm feeling inside me. Like, mm. did I make a bad choice by playing? I should have just played soccer. It's, it, it's no longer about the game that I love. It's about the head that the game has done to me. <sighs> yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes. Um, do you have any questions that you would like to ask from us? From you guys? Mm. It, this is. Yeah, the first. Uh, I'm overwhelmed by this whole thing, but I'm happy. This is better than the, what we we're doing yesterday, because I'm seeing you guys. <laughs> um, I, I think there's a lot of things that I haven't said, but this is like a. This is. Oof, I got that out. Um, mm. I I would like to. Do you think, is there anybody that I could talk to after all this without the cameras, or is this the end of it, or...? Well, it's not the end of it, because uh, we will... We will make a, a report, we will make recommendations, and uh, perhaps that is why I want to ask you, if you were in our position, what would you say? This is what would be the ideal thing to do for cricketers or for black cricketers. 
No, I, I think uh, a person like myself, I just want a platform where I could give uh, all this experience that I have mm. to somebody else that doesn't know anything. Uh, I mean, cricket is a, it, it's a, I mean, it's, mm. it's not like soccer or rugby, 90 minutes and everybody. Cricket is like, imagine having something like where uh, in the township uh, people come every Saturday, Sunday, you got them jumping castles, the kids are playing and it, it, it can do something. I mean, mm. uh, I, I would just like that opportunity to, to be able to change my community or lots of communities using this, this brand of cricket. That, mm. that, that is what that, that's what would make my life go on better mm. because um, as much as I look better or whatever but it, I don't want that young kid to be in a corner because Sunny Boy is grumpy about he didn't play for South Africa no I don't want that I want another kid to to go out there and express who they are via using the cricketing tool uh, yeah so I want to use cricket as a tool of um, uniting the the people in the in the township because uh, I, I don't I don't see anything else but that uh, soccer I know there's a lot of tournaments there's a lot of things that soccer do and what what but the one that cricket would do would be something wow because uh, cricket is a gentleman's sport. <laughs> we want to create more gentlemen in the townships. There, there, there's less gentlemen in the township these days because they, they are not given an, a platform where we can create that. So I want to, if we can get a platform where people like myself can create a platform for the young, young boys like my, when I was young, yeah. Mm. In fact, I think you have captured what you have just said. In paragraph 22 of your affidavit, and I think it's good enough for me to read it into the record because it expresses your hope and aspirations. You say, if it were up to me, I would suggest we get empowered by being given a platform to run youth development programs in our communities mm. and schools. I have a feeling that participating in this SJN process will make it hard for me to get a job at CSA or any opportunity for that matter. I do not want to make enemies out of my testimony in this process, but I hope that my testimony would be taken in a positive light. I hope Cricket South Africa will take great strides to correcting their mistakes and making things right. I love the game, and my son, is also passionate about it. So I have to fight not just for myself, but for him too. Yeah. yeah. Look, you are not alone <laughs> in expressing this sense that because you have taken the step to come and tell the nation your experiences, you might be victimized. Why would that have to be so, given that what you said here is something that you were prepared to take an oath to? Why would anyone want to victimize you? What do you think? Uh, I think uh, it's, the, it's the rolling of the dice that, I mean, uh, as I said, I didn't have to come here, but mm. uh, I've got so much to lose. All these years that I've put in into this game, mm. this is the only thing I, I bet you now, uh, the passion that I have for the game, 
it just doesn't grow overnight. Mm. And for me to worry about who, who's going to think what of me, well, who are they going to talk about if they're not talking about me? That's mm. the attitude that I have. But uh, if, if it means that me standing here, it's going to make uh, another sunny boy's life better, I'd rather stand here and say whatever I'm saying. Because it's, it's, we just want to see the game going forward. We're not about uh, trying to get ourselves uplifted by something. We just want to see the game being played in a, in a fair manner for everybody. Everybody must get whatever they deserve and everybody must enjoy watching the game. Yeah. We, 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 we're done with the time of, uh, oh, he's playing because he's black, this and uh, nah. That is done. We want to go see, watch the game play, everybody must get whatever they deserve uh, in the name of the game. And for me, especially, with, as I said, in the township, if we can get the cricket going like when I grew up, there will be less boys doing all these things that are going on. You, you, you're not going to know un unless you see what's going on in the township. And cricket doesn't have time for, for boys to mess around. Cricket is the whole day. By the time we to Chiswa Ilanga, you want to go home, shower, and just relax and go wake up again. I mean, it's, it, we need cricket in the township. I think it, it, it is one of the biggest game changes of how the, the township will look at, or people will look at the township. If there's cricket, I think it, it will make a huge difference. So my, I'm crying for, for, for that. We must have um, the morals of gentlemen. We need gentlemen in townships. There's no gentlemen. There's too many totties, and we are cricket and totties don't get along. How old is your son now? He is ten years old, sir. Is he playing? Or yeah. Does he have any? Yeah, the one in England is sixteen. The one in uh, the one that I live with is ten years old, and I've got a, a daughter, a six-year-old daughter as well. And is your daughter also passionate about oh. cricket? We live, eat cricket in my house. That is our, our thing. We Including live, eat. your wife, yeah? Yeah, uh, she, she's the one behind the scenes. She's, <laughs> she's the one, uh, uh, she's my backbone. She's my session. <laughs> yeah, no, she, without her, I would have probably throw myself off the 10th floor. Yeah. yeah. But uh, the weird thing is I'm complaining about all these things. Imagine being with somebody like me what you got to say, what she's got to say about the situation that cricket has got us into. It will be another uh, chapter. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, you guys are asking me about all these things. Imagine having a partner like myself with the situation that I'm in. Imagine what she's got to say. We were having that conversation last night after I spoke to you guys. I'm like, Geez. and imagine what she's got to say. And what she had to say, it was like mind-blowing because I bring a lot of baggage with me. There is so much baggage that she has to to take with, and the kids as well. A lot of baggage. Yeah? Imagine being Sunny Boy Letzila's son, the guy that stole such an instant Lucas bed. You understand? So, yeah. But out of all this, I hope good comes out of all this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have to, I have to thank you. Um, Um, I have to thank you for for having had the courage to come here and say, amongst other things, that you you got so affected by what was going around you that at one stage you decided to take your own life out of the frustrations that you had. And that touched me because you may or may not know that uh,
a few years ago. I lost my own son to suicide. Sorry, dear. Thank you for coming. We will adjourn.
Peterson, can you hear me? I just want to test the audience. Good morning, yes, I can. Oh, loud. Can you just, just see if it will be better if I remove my earphones? Uh, better in what way? Oh, you didn't you hear me properly without, mm. you don't hear me properly without your head, headphones. Is that it? Yeah, I, I was trying to figure out what was the best word for the earphones, but, uh, for the headphones, but I think I will use the headphones. Yes. Um, because we can hear you loudly and clearly. But uh, it's you who has to hear us. <laughs> rather than the other way around, but it's good if all of us can hear each other or one another. I was struggling to hear that. You were struggling. Do you say you were struggling to, to hear me? Yes, I think that. Oh, yeah, okay. Right. Um, I'm going to ask Advocate Nile to, to swear you in as a participant. You will either, you, if you take an oath, that's what she will ask you to do. If you would rather affirm, that's what she will ask you to do in terms of your preference. Advocate Nile. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Alviro. Yes. Um, are you going to take an oath or are you going to affirm? I'll take an oath. Okay. Mr. Alvira Peterson, do you swear that the evidence that you're about to give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If that is so, please uh, raise your right hand and say, so help me God. So help me God. Thank you very much. You've now been sworn in as a as a participant in the SJN proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. July. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Peterson, how are you? Good morning, I'm well. I hope you are too. I'm good. Mr. Peterson, your affidavit, your affidavit, you signed it. Uh, there's no date. It could have been yesterday. Uh, so when you when you take an oath, you take it in also in respect of this affidavit, which is in front of you, right? Yes. yes. Now, I've looked at your affidavit. You you in your background as you start your affidavit, it's all about the issue of the match fixing. You don't yes. take us through your background as a cricket player. Can you please start there? As a cricket player, young man starting his cricket somewhere in the township, in the school somewhere, and uh, going to wherever, up to the professional cricket. And then we can talk about this after that. Well, I was I was born in Port Elizabeth, now Kabecha, um, and, and that's where I grew up in a in a place called Galvandale. Um, at the age of eight years old, I decided then already that I wanted to play for South Africa, and um, you know through all the street cricket and practices and playing for my club Galvandale, um, eventually I was. I was approached by a club in Pretoria, Estres Cricket Club, to join them, which I did um, when I was 19 years old. And through playing in the, in the Northern Leagues, I then made my professional debut uh, for Titans in 2000 and 2001. Um, proceeded to play for Titans for about six or seven years and then moved to the Lions. Um, where I played for 10 years till the end of my career. Um, I made my international debut in 2010 for South Africa. I played all three, all three formats for South Africa, Test Cricket, 
One Day Internationals and T20 Internationals. Um, and I retired in 2014. Okay. Now I retired in 2014. I think it was just, you retired 2014. Yes. From international cricket. From international cricket. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. No, that's fine. So from 2015, who were you playing for? Um, in, 2014, in 2014, um, after I retired, I then played for Lancashire in 2015 and 2016, as well as in Lancashire in England. And then um, I, re I still played for the Lions in South Africa, the High Fold Lions. So the year 2015-2016 or 2016-2017, who were you playing for? I was contracted by the Lions. By the Lions, okay. And then in paragraph one, you are say you are currently employed by Christ Church Preparatory School and College as the Director of Sports and Culture. Yes, I am. And also as an analyst commentator and analyst by the SABC. That is correct. Okay. Then you state that the reason, it would seem that that's the only reason why you depose to this affidavit is to bring to the attention of the transformation ombudsman the perceived injustices which were pre perpetrated by the CSA and you mentioned David Becker in the handling of investigations regarding match fixing allegation. That is the reason for you writing this, uh, deposing to this affidavit. Yeah. yeah it, is, um, it, it is indeed. Yeah. I would urge like you to, without necessarily reading the affidavit, explain to the chairperson. What is your gripe about that process? Well, I think it's quite a, it's quite a complex thing. Um, but uh, in a nutshell, um, as per my affidavit, um, I think it's important that the background is being painted in terms of uh, what led to it, how, in my opinion, it was, it was led by, by David Becker. But, but most importantly, I think it's important to, to also make mention that, in my opinion, I think Cricket South Africa as a whole, the stakeholders of Cricket South Africa, um, wasn't quite aware of what actually happened inside the investigation. Um, and to a large degree, degree, also the retired judge president, Bernard, um, Bernard Njopin. Uh, I say this because the investigation started or, or re the reportings were made in September of 2015. And I think the judge pres president was only appointed in 2016 or towards the end of 2015. So from the time that it actually, the reporting happened to the time that he was reported, um, appointed by Cricket South Africa, uh, you know, there's, there's a couple of months in between. And I'm not quite sure he knows exactly what has happened. And, and to me, the, the question is, was his appointment just to, to rubber stamp, perhaps, um, an investigation to give credibility to it, whereas I think there's a lot of discrepancies in regards to that. So, I mean, I can't say conclusively that is the situation. It's really a question that uh, I think needs to be explored. You, 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 did you ever appear before Judge Mwepe? I've never appeared before him. I've never met him. I have never had correspondence from him, and I've never written to him yeah. throughout this investigation. David Becker was the person, and I believe David Becker led this investigation. Okay. Okay, you can continue, can continue. explain. So I think in terms of in terms of the background of um, of it all is that 
I, I want to I want to take you back to um, the time that I was still captain of the Lions, um, and there were one specific game we played in Cape Town against the Warriors, um, a T Twenty game. I was the captain. Gulam Bodhi um, came in. I was I was batting. Gulam Bodhi came in um, and proceeded to run me out. Now I was striking at 150 percent at the time. So I was run out. Um, he then batted and batted at a strike rate of 50. We lost the game. At the end of that game, uh, I already suspected that you know Gulam was probably up to something. I didn't have any evidence of it. And what I wanted was to make sure that um, he's not in the team as a captain. Uh, I pushed for that, uh, but the selectors obviously um, wouldn't allow me to not have him in the team. And uh, before the next game, I stepped down as, as uh, the Lions captain. Now, I understand that in terms of the selectors, they might not have known or, or had the feeling what I had in terms of um, that they might be wrongdoing. Um, and, and you know, I haven't mentioned it to them because I can't accuse someone if there's no information of that of that wrongdoing. Um, but what I've done is I stepped down as captain. Um, and yes, I, you know, I made statements to the media why I stepped down, and the reason given was because of interference from other selectors or board members, etc. Now the convener selector happened to be part of the board as well. Um, so, so, so that is the background of it. And then, uh, probably a year or so later, um, and in a nutshell, because I've also, I've also given the, the, the ombudsman both my affidavits that I made during the investigation, which is quite substantial. And, you know, the, um, the whole thing is so complex as well. That I don't think two hours will be enough for it. But anyway, um, in a nutshell, I began to suspect that some players were trying to recruit me in a match fixing scam. And after I've had several meetings with Gulam Bodhi, another teammate of mine at the Lions at the time, and two gentlemen um, that Gulam introduced as uh, his friends, two gentlemen of Indian origin. Now, the, the steps that I took is that um, I reported the matter to Tony Irish, who was the then SACA CEO of the South African Cricketers Association CEO at the time. And that was reported um, on the 8th of the 10th month in 2015, um, in October. And, and this was after I received messages from one of my Lions teammates um, on the evening of the seven, informing me that he had received messages from a Cobra player um, that, and he told me that's also involved in this. Now after, on, on, so I received that on the seven. The next day on the eighth, I met this, I met this teammate in the change room when we were, I think we were practicing. Um, and I said, I want to make sure, show me that the messages actually come from this person that you mentioned the night before you showed me. And it was from the person. Um, and then I reported the matter to Tony Irish, who then told me that I must hold on to the information, not tell anyone about it. He will make arrangements to come meet with me. Who is Irish? Tony Irish is a... At the time, he was the SACA CEO, South African Cricket Association CEO. SACA gives um, education to players on corruption, etc. So Tony Irish was obviously based in Cape Town. I'm based in Johannesburg. And he said, I must hold on to the information. I mustn't tell anyone about it. And he will make arrangements to see me. On the 12th of October, 
he then flew down from Cape Town and we met in Johannesburg. And I told him, uh, that I gave him the information and effectively did the reporting. After I had met with him, he then contacted Louis Cole to join us in the meeting. Now, Louis Cole is the anti-corruption officer for Cricket South Africa. Louis then joined, joined us and I told him exactly the same as what I told Tony Irish in terms of the reporting. Louis then proceeded to thank me for reporting and said that um, Gulam Bodhi and others are on his radar and that he's aware of something that might um, be going on. Now, I'm just going to fast forward. In regards to this particular incident, I was charged by David Becker through, through um, Cricket South Africa for reporting late. And the reporting late means that Tony Irish was not the person that I needed to report to and that it should have been Dewey Cole. Even though I can ask the question why Tony Irish didn't tell me that on the 8th of October, instead when he, when he said, hold on to the information and um, I will make arrangements to meet with you. And we met on the 12th. So I was charged for you. You were told by Mr. Irish to keep the information. And, and what did you understand that to mean, keep the information? Sorry. What did you understand that to mean when he said to you, please keep the information? Keep the information and not mention it to anyone. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he's that's what he said. I kept the information and not mentioned it to anyone. So then you, you, you were saying then you were charged now? Yeah, so I was charged uh, for, that was one of the charges for late reporting. Mm -hmm. Do you have the chart sheet and in front of you? I do. Yes. Which charge is it? Okay. Get it for you. Charge 3.3.1. Yes. It reads you failed to disclose an, an approach made by Mr. Zolekile on 5 October 2015 to the designated anti corruption official without unnecessary delay. That's right. Yes. Where do we find it? On page 3 of the chat sheet. In front. Which one is it? Page three. Yes. Four point three point one as well. It reads. Uh, the information provided to you by Mr. Tsolekile on 5 October 2015 involving participants, Mr. Bodhi and Mr. Tsolekile was not disclosed to the designated anti-corruption official without unnecessary delay. Do you know how much the delay is? How much time are you expected within which period? are you expected to report? You said you heard about it on the 7th, 
and then you reported it on the 8th. And, uh, yeah. So I, I, I got the messages from this teammate of mine, yeah. uh, which, is, which has now been mentioned publicly, Mr. Tzolikida. Yeah. And um, on the 8th, I asked for confirmation that it in fact came from the person that he mentioned. Mm. Because I mean, it could have been, it could have been someone else sending him the messages. Mm. Mm. So I wanted proof that it was in fact from this person. Mm. And in my affidavit, the messages are there. The, communi the communication between us where he actually mentioned names. <coughs> so, so what I am saying is that I reported the matter after I received confirmation on the 8th. I reported the matter on the 8th to Tony Irish. Yes. And that should constitute reporting. And I say that, and I say that because, and further on I will deal with this, that it only came to light in, 20, in 2020, where another person, Mr. Vaughan von Yarstow, mentioned that he reported the matter to Saka as well. He's reporting. Even though there's discrepancies in in the facts that he presented, he was in charge for, for late reporting, mm -hmm. but I was charged for, late, for, for reporting, for late reporting, even though, in my opinion, and I stand by that, that I have reported at the earliest convenience. Can, can, can I? Kate, because in your affidavit or statement that you you, 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 you submitted some time ago, you mentioned a lot of players there. Who? Yes. So other than Tzolekile, who is going to come and make his own testimony, please avoid to mention the names of those players, but we would need to go to your statement where you yes. are stating that there were a number of people who were allegations against whom were made, but those people were never charged. So are you referring to my initial statement? Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so what, what, what happens was, I was informed by uh, one Mr. Tolekile that several players were involved. Um, it turns out that, and, and as, I, as I mentioned, most of us were kept in the dark in terms of the investigation. Those players that were mentioned were charged, others were not. Yeah. And um, it came out that, or, or I, would, I would suppose that they weren't involved, um, even though Tolekila mentioned those names. Okay. So um, I'm not sure if, if I'm at liberty to discuss those names when they haven't been charged by by David Becker and Co. No. Or is it up or is it up to David Becker to, to mention those names? No, we will deal with that later as to how you handle it. I don't want you to digress a, a, a lot. You were yeah. at the point when you were telling us about the charges that were preferred against you in relation yes. to your failure to report uh, yeah. without delay on time, failure to report on time. And you do say that you did indeed report. And That's to you, me. the reporting to Mr. Irish was the reporting. Yes. Yeah. OK. Uh, there's also a further one, 4.3.2, yep. which is another charge that was leveled against me. Mm -hmm. And it reads the WhatsApp messages you received from Mr. Tolekila on 7 October 2015, and which you acknowledge amounted in your mind to fixing on an industrial scale and which involved other participants were not disclosed to the designated anti-corruption official without unnecessary delay. Mm. Yeah. I, I submit that I did report it. They do have the messages and it is possibly up to the, uh, to particularly Mr. Mr. Becker, 
to explain what is what is uh, reporting immediately, because I feel that I have reported at the earliest um, time that I could. Yeah, you yeah, can proceed. You can proceed. So, and then on, so as I mentioned on the 12th of October, I then met with, with um, Tony Irish, and then he called Louis Cole to join us after that meeting, which I've reported to Louis as well. Louis then asked, Louis Cole then asked me to go back to my teammate and ask him to return the money that he received from Gulam Bodhi and others. Um, and I must try, try and also convince him to report the matter. Um, he can, he, what I can tell him is that he can give the money to Saka for safekeeping. Um, I went back to my teammate and I said, you know, perhaps you should should report the matter. I thought about it. You should report the matter and, um, you know, give the money back. And he simply told me that he had nothing to report. And then on the 4th of November, 2015, the following month, after having met with, with Gulam, After I met with Gulam Bodhi and um, the gentleman of Indian origin, Bodhi introduced as his friend, as well as overhearing some players talk before the game on the fourth T20 game against the Dolphins in Durban. I suspected that one of our Ram Slam um, T20 games were going to be fixed. Now, Louis Cole was in Durban at the stadium. And before, when we arrived at the stadium and going into the change room, I informed Louis that this game might be under threat. This is the situation. This is what's going to happen. This over, these players will be involved. And the game proceeded. It happened as I mentioned to him what was going to happen. Um, and you know, no intervention was took place from cricket South Africa or the local side. And it beats me, as I mentioned in my affidavit, why a game that I told them might be fixed was allowed to continue without intervention. And I maintain, as I have previously on social media with my posts, and now in my affidavit, that fixing took place in the T20 Ram Slam competition 2015-2016. And I deal with why I say so in my affidavit. Uh, despite Cricket South Africa sending out communication saying that no fixing took place. And I understand that. If, uh, if fixing happens in a competition, it could be bad for sponsors, it could be bad for, uh, for the brand itself, and it could also impact on, on future developments. I know that Cricket South Africa were busy with um, the global T20 league at the time, um, so that could, could have a negative effect on it. And for the reasons that I set out, I maintain that fixing happened in, in the T20 Ram Slam competition. Now, on, on 20 September 2019, I also wrote on, on Twitter, and I mentioned the following, if I might. I said the 20th of September 2019. This was after my, my sanction expired. And I said, Dear media, 
You failed to report and inform loyal cricket fans of the biggest sports corruption case in South Africa. What and who are you protecting? Criminal Gulam Bodhi to be sentenced today in the Pretoria Commercial Crimes Court. He and his mates fixed matches in South Africa. Hashtag cover up or open up. Now I have nothing against Gulam Bodhi. And the reason why I wrote this is because I wanted to bring attention to what I know and what I want people to know that match fixing, in my opinion, happened in that season. Despite Cricket South Africa. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson, can I can I just ask what probably is a stupid question? If you were to tell somebody about what match fixing is, can you just explain to me as a lay person the ingredients of match fixing? What happens? Okay. So, so, so match fixing, if you approach, if you approach a player um, and let's use uh, bowling, you approach, approach a player and you say, I want you in this specific over, let's call it the eighth over. I want you in the eighth over to concede more than 14 runs or 15 runs because the bookies themselves will make a bet on that specific over that it will go for more than 14 or 15 runs. The player in question then, the bowler, would give a signal to someone within the ground to say the fix is on. Now that could be someone, the bowler tying his shoelace or changing his boots or whatever the case might be. That is a signal that is predetermined before the game. Now, when is it? I want you to concede. How does it happen? To, what do you say to the player the player must do or must not do in order for the player to have conceded? Uh, conceded meaning, meaning his over must go for more than 14 runs. His six ball that he bowls must go for more than 14 runs. Mm. Now, you can either, obviously as a bowler, you're gonna bowl bad deliveries or you bowl a couple of wides and no balls, etc. cetera, um, to make sure that that over goes for more than 14 runs. You then get, uh, you then get an amount or the agreed amount, let's call it 100,000, 200, 300, 500,000 for that over. The bowler then gives a signal that um, either by changing boots or tying his shoelace or whatever the case might be, and the bookie or the person within the ground will know exactly that's how it will happen. And then it gives that bookie time to, to place bets on that specific over. And that is how fixing happens. Yeah. Mm. So effectively, there's an intention to underperform. Yeah. yeah, that's what it is. And, and, and to me, um, I was indeed very surprised when, when I was charged with, with all these charges leveled against me. But as I mentioned as well in my affidavit that I think it was not bona fide, but instead done with a malicious intent to get me to accept a sanction. Mm. So there's two there's two different things in, in regards to to this. There's the intention to to fix matches and take money, etc. And then there's the reporting side, reporting late and that sort of stuff. Those are the things that I was charged with. Even though out in the media, I'm grouped amongst match the, the guys who've actually took money. And in some, in some media articles, I was mentioned as a match fixer, which is completely incorrect. If you go to page two of 
the sanction agreement. I know that you are going to talk to this document. The sanction agreement. Page two. Page two of the sanction agreement. Okay. There, although you were charged, the charges according to the charge sheet, it was charge one, charge two, charge three, charge four. But here you admit, you seem to be admitting on charge four, five, six, and seven. And it says, failing to disclose to the designated anti-corruption official without unnecessary delay full details of any approaches or invitations received by the participant to engage in corrupt conduct under this anti-corruption code. Why did you admit that? Uh, just tell me uh, which one are we referring page to? Page two of the sanction agreement. Yes. Where it says, no, now therefore, in terms of Article 5.1.12 of the code, the parties have agreed the following. One, Patterson admits to the following charges under the code. Are you there? Therefore, in terms of Article 5.1.12, Yes, 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 I'm there, yeah. Yes, charges for, yes. It then say Patterson admits to the following charges. So if you strongly believe that you reported, there was no delay in your reporting, why then did you admit? Yeah. This is, uh, so if you look at my supplementary affidavit. Yeah. I've got your supplement. My supplementary affidavit deals with the meetings I have had with Gulambodi and gentlemen with Indian origin, which turns out to be the bookies. Yeah. Those, those meetings weren't... Um, weren't disclosed to the anti-corruption official mm -hmm. immediately. And that's what I admit to. Oh, okay. Okay. And, 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 and in my affidavits, and in this specific affidavit to the Ombudsman, as well as my initial affidavit um, in the corruption investigation and my supplementary affidavit, I deal with why those weren't dealt with and the security issues relating to all of that uh, in regards to me and my family. And that is, that is what I agreed to in that. So you were talking about after the meeting of the 12th, we were on the 4th of November. So on the, on the, 4th, of, on the 4th of November, um, as I mentioned, in my opinion, fixing happened. After the game then, I met with Bodhi, yeah. uh, when he persisted to, to meet with me, met with him outside the hotel that we stayed at, um, and he wanted to check the next day. And I asked him, what, what, why is it so urgent? Why do you need to chat to me? And he said, business. And that's when I stopped contact with Bodhi because I knew that um, the recall told me that they're closing in on him. And on the 6th of November, I think it's the 6th of November, I speak under correction, the day of the ramp slam between Lions and Titans in Potchefstroom. I was then told by Louis Cole that Bodhi has been served with papers. Um, and quite, quite ironically, um, in, in my interview with the anti-corruption 
officials, David Becker and Louis Cole, they did mention that Bodhi informed the guys that were that were part of the swing that they must either delete um, communication because CSA is now on their tracks. And this was also confirmed by at least one player. Um, I was never informed by Bodhi of that. This player actually said, Gula Bodhi told us that you are the whistleblower, which means you, meaning Alvaro Peterson. And, and, and all these things relate and it goes back to when, when I was charged on the 12th of November, that shows that the charges brought against me were malicious. And they're absolutely, even in my, in my um, media statement after I was charged, I deal with it in my statement. And I said the following, the charges follow a lengthy negotiation the negotiating period between Alvira and Cricket South Africa, in which Alvira was offered a plea bargain. Whilst Alvira is willing to take responsibilities for his action over this period, although they were taken in good faith under the circumstances at the time, he could not reach an agreement with Cricket South Africa because he believes the sanctions which would have been imposed were disproportionate to Alvira's action and do not take sufficient cognizance of the defenses and mitigating circumstances put forward by Alvira. The charges brought by CSA are heavy handed, in particular the charges relating to contriving to fix and otherwise improperly influencing or being party to, to a scheme in which attempts to, would, would be made to fix or otherwise improperly influence a match in the T20 Ram Slam series. Um, and seeking to accept, accepting or agreeing to accept a bribe or reward to fix or contrive to fix or influence improperly a match or matches in the 2015 Rand Slam T20 competition are without merit. And they are without merit. <laughs> Yet I was charged publicly in trying to possibly humiliate me and prejudicing me financially, professional, and professional. So, as I mentioned in my affidavit, that I maintain that match fixing took place in the 2015 Grand Slam T20 competition for the following reasons. Because I reported the fix to Louis Cole before the game. I explained to him what will happen before the game, and it happened. Yet CSA made a public statement that fix fixing did not take place during the Grand Slam T20 competition and that they intercepted any fix. It is in my opinion that fixing took place based on the facts above. Furthermore, it would appear that it is because of this opinion that I hold that seemed to anger David Becker. And then I further said in 14.4, David Becker through CSA tried to silence me on many occasions, particularly when I tried to bring attention to the fixing scandal, as I mentioned, my post on the 20th of September, 2019, which is there for everyone to see. Becker through CSA has gone as far as wrongfully interfering with my employment relationship with SABC and undermining my basic human rights as per the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which South Africa is a signatory of. And I have evidence of this unlawful interference as well as witnesses to this effect, we one can establish a prima facie case of wrongdoing or wrongful interference with my employment relationship. Can you explain how, how did that happen, the interference? Okay, so in terms of the interference, what, is, what has happened is Cricket South Africa or, or SABC would place commentators uh, for specific games. I'm contracted to SABC to commentate. You obviously earn as per the matches that you, you commentate on. Um, I, was, I was excluded from, from the commentary team by SABC on the request of Cricket South Africa on more than one occasion. And this was confirmed by the former CEO 
the Bandura who also confirmed that he's happy to give to be a witness in that regard. And that, that instruction actually came from David Beckham. So that to me is wrongful interference because uh, yeah, I mean firstly I've served my 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 sentence of of two years. And for someone to interfere in that way. Your contract with the SABC is after you served the two years? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it was after I served my, my two years um, that I entered into an agreement with them. And I've got a long standing relationship with, with the SABC. Um, so I've done many things. In time. Oh, Mr. Moore, when he says he was instructed by Mr. Becker, he's the CEO. Did he tell you how does he act on the instructions of Mr. Becker? As I, as I mentioned earlier in my, in my submission, it's my opinion that, and from what I've known throughout this investigation, is that David Becker was in fact the one that led this investigation and that people within Cricket South Africa did not quite know what was happening, apart from Arun Logat, um, who was the CEO at the time. So when this comes up, I think what, what Cricket South Africa have done, certainly um, Mr. Tabang Moreau, um, and I speak under correction, would probably have been to consult David Becker, who was the head of this investigation and say, this is what's happening, um, what can we do? Or was it a case of David Becker actually getting in touch with Cricket South Africa and saying, this is the statements that Alviro made. Um, you know, we need to just cut him short, I don't know. But certainly Mr. Tabang Moreau confirmed that he is prepared. In fact, he confirmed that that is what was happening, that it was instruction from uh, Cricket South Africa informing SABC that they must exclude me. And only after I wrote um, to Dr. Jock Fall on the 20th of December, he was then the acting CEO setting out my concern with Cricket South Africa blocking my work with SABC. And at that stage, I've lost out on the first test already uh, that, is, that would have started on the 26th of December because SABC needs to, needed to place their commentators. Then what I, what I mentioned is I said, all I want is I want you to tell me that they, you have no objection to me commentating. Uh, so on the 23rd of December, 2019, at 15, I received a WhatsApp message from Dr. Jock for stating we have no objection. And after that, I started commentating on the next test match and subsequently the whole season. And it is my submission that Mr. Becker was a key role player in the blocking of my work and thereby adverse, adversely trying to impact my work and my livelihood. Yeah, you can proceed. Yeah, proceed. So, <sighs> And then I go to number 19 of my, of, of, my, of my affidavit, where I say that David Becker threatened me with criminal sanction for perjury and said if I said that I have to accept a sanction, that's what during the, the investigation. Otherwise, they will publicly charge me and it won't be good for my image. So, already during the investigation, I was threatened 
with charges and media statements, etc. That will obviously not be good for my image. But as mentioned, my first my first statement states that I can correct, and I quote, I can correct, alter, or add anything I wish. And I've simply done so with my supplementary statement. And that's why the supplementary statement is there. Now, based on the two statements, um, in my initial statement, I was allowed to make a supplementary statement. But based on that, he interpreted that as perjury, which I don't think there's a case for that, or yeah. any criminal sanction um, in that regard, certainly against me. And then I also say for Becker personally, or through CSA to inform journalists, my employer and the wider cricket community, that I could still face criminal charges and thereby prejudicing me financially and professionally is with respect, vexatious, wrong, possibly illegal, or, and or defamatory. And in paragraph 20, yeah. I then say that in spite of my voluntary reporting that I, what I thought was match fixing scam at the earliest opportunity, I could, David Becker through Cricket South Africa went ahead and charged me on the 12th of November, 2016. I was charged with multiple charges by CSA through the attorney, David Becker. And I believe the proffering of charges, especially the charges relating to fixing and contriving to fix any match or matches in the 2015, 16 Ram Slam competition were not bona fide, but instead done with a malified and malicious intent in order to one, reach a settlement in respect of the disciplinary process with me on terms unilaterally and unreasonably dictated by Becker and company, and two, to embarrass and irreparably prejudice me professionally, financially, and personally. I further think David Becker took exception that I actually challenged him. And then I go further and I say, I say the charges were not bona fide because when the investigators interviewed me in Manchester in July 2016, while I was in England, uh, without my attorney, they accepted my version of events and concluded that I didn't take any money or attempted to fix any gains. And also in Manchester, David Beck informed me that I will have to accept a sanction or they will charge me publicly and that won't be good for my image. Uh, Beck informed me on many occasions in Manchester and in South Africa that should I not accept a sanction, they will push for a life ban in the tribunal here. A tribunal that obviously they will set up themselves. And before the interview, started in Manchester, I requested a copy of the interview, the full interview to which they agreed to. However, they only sent part of the interview to my attorneys and not the full interview. And also David Becker asked me in Manchester if I would like to change my attorneys. I immediately answered, no, not at all. And my question is, why would he want me to do that when my attorney conducted himself properly and professionally? Is this conduct even proper from a legal practitioner? And after re receiving the charges on 12 November 2016, my legal team requested information from Becker in order to provide our response to the charges. The information requested was important as without it, I would have been prejudiced requested the information on three separate occasions, even in threatening to proceed to approach the High Court for the necessary relief, but Becker would not provide such. I believe that uh, David Becker wanted to get the sanction done at all costs as soon as possible, possibly because CSA was in the planning stages of the global T20 tournament and any fixing allegations could have an adverse effect on the league. CSA sponsors the image of Cricket South Africa and its leadership. And I also wanted the world to know about the fixing that took place. 
And by sanctioning me, could be seen as a way of silencing me. So you then say you eventually <clears throat> agreed to a two-year sanction. Uh, were you not represented at the time when you agreed to this two-year sanction? I beg your pardon? You not represented, legally represented. I was represented. So when we, when we received uh, the charges, um, I then had two attorneys and two advocates, one being a senior counsel. Um, and my legal team then requested all this information because we needed to give a response within 14 days. We, in fact, when we didn't get uh, any help from David Beck in particular, we have requested an extension so that in order that we can actually give a proper response. And I was, at a for, I was, uh, I was afforded the extension, but I wasn't afforded the information that we needed in order to give the response. Um, also, when I was charged, um, we, we either requested to, to have a public hearing, which was denied. Now, when we, and I thought that if we have a public hearing, at least the public will know exactly what has happened and they can judge for themselves. So, so based on all those factors, I eventually agreed to a two-year sanction because, firstly, I was told by Becca in Manchester that something to the effect of it is expensive to proceed to a tribunal as well, through courts effectively implying, as I understood it, that they, Cricket South Africa, have more money than me and I can't match its financial muscle. Two, it became clear that Becker was out to tarnish my reputation and irreparably prejudiced me professionally, financially, and personally, possibly because I held, I had the audacity to challenge him and not let him have his way. Three, we were hoping for public hearings so that the public can know what transpired. But Becker informed my attorney that the hearing will not be public hearings and that they would, they would set up the tribunal I simply did not trust them, and I would not want to be, appear before a tribunal that might have been a kangaroo court, where the damage to my career and life could have been irreparable. My legal team, as I mentioned earlier, my legal team consisted of two advocates, one being a senior counsel and two attorneys. You can imagine this cost a lot of money, and my legal bill would have run well into the millions in terms of proceeding through tribunals and then courts, et cetera. Saka agreed initially to cover my legal bill. But when I was ready to challenge Cricket South Africa, they informed me that they will only cover 50,000 Rand. Now 50,000 Rand could possibly cover the legal fees for one day of work for a four man strong legal team. One being a senior counsel, as I mentioned. A rude law that this is another reason why I've accepted it. Arun Rogat, then Cricket South Africa CEO, agreed that well, he will incorporate me back into the CSA structures after 12 months. This obviously didn't happen. And then also, the sixth point that I make, the charges would be of a reporting and not corruption related nature. On this score, it would appear that David Becker through Cricket South Africa tried their very best to ensure that I was grouped with those who accepted money from bookies and body. And then I also find it quite disturbing that after my interview with, with Becca and Louis Cole in Manchester, that they wanted me to accept a ban of seven years, I think, which I refused to take. They then offered to reduce it to four years and then three years. When I rejected the three years, I think that's when they charged me. Eventually I settled for the two year ban. And I believe even the two year ban was unfair 
in view of the fact of our history shows that the last play, the last time players were charged with match fixing, two players who were found guilty with intent to fix matches and games were only given six months ban and were back in the game soon thereafter. It makes me wonder what the difference is between me and those players. It is even intriguing considering that I was not involved with fixing or influencing of any games. Why was I given a two year ban when I said, which I settled for after fighting to have the ban reduced? And then I said, it seems to me that there was discrimination in who was investigated and who was not. The case in point is Vaughan van Jarstal, as I feel that there's a discrepancy between his version and Saka's version around what he knew about match fixing allegations. So I say this because on the 8th of August 2020, last year, Vaughan said in a Times Live interview, at the F and, and I got at the Africa Cup T20 game in Poch, Gulam approached me on the Saturday morning. I met him that night, which means the Saturday night, played on the Sunday, and drove back on the bus from where I called Sacra and spoke to Andrew Brits. So, Mr. Andrew Britsky, is it not the same position that was occupied by? Mr. Irish. By Mr. Mr. Irish. You remember you reported to Mr. I, Tony yes. Irish. Both of them, both of them worked for, for Saka at the time. Yeah. Tony Irish was the CEO. Andrew Gerska was the, I think, the legal advisor. I speak under correction. Okay. But both of them worked for Saka at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that was on the 8th of August, 2020. On the ninth, my interaction with a family member of Vaughan on Twitter, I said, it appears he was treated differently to others based on the facts. Do you have any idea why that, that is? And she replied, maybe because he was a witness and told them immediately and not waited or took the money. So immediately here, remember earlier you asked me, what is immediately in terms of reporting? So immediately here is what? Gulam Bodhi approaching on Saturday morning. Born according to his statement, reported the Sunday evening. So there's no difference to my uh, reporting on the, when I, when I got confirmation on the 8th, reported on the 8th. In fact, yeah. I reported before him. I was charged. And then further on, Andrew Breska said in an interview with SABC, I think that, and, and I quote, Vaughan called Saka via telephone one morning, while Vaughan said he phoned the evening of Sunday. So someone is, you know, there's, there's some discrepancy there. The issues are as follow. By Vaughan's own account, he did not report immediately. If you, if you compare immediately to my reporting and why I was charged. Two, was Vaughan offered money? Because this family member said, maybe he was a witness and told them immediately and not waited or took the money. What money is she referring to? And then I and then I go further and I say, if so, why was I charged publicly and nothing happened to him anymore? Was it a case of him being briefed by Becker and Co on what to say? Did they do the same with a current protest player who's currently playing for the protest? which I deal with in my, in my statement, and I wish not to mention this player's name at this stage. 
And then the conclusion is inescapable that certain players were treated differently during the match fixing investigation, given the information I have. Furthermore, it would appear that CSA president last year, Mr. Chris Nanzani, did not know much of what actually transpired in the investigation and that CSA did not have the capacity to want to deal with this matter. And I say this because on the 8th of August 2020, now dealt with Vaughan when he made statements in the media on the 8th, and I've had certain conversations with some people on Twitter, etc., cetera, um, where I have tweeted, and I just want to bring it up quickly. So I have tweeted, breaking exclamation marks, new evidence came to light that will show that the investigation appeared to be biased. Official CSA, I will give you until 10 o'clock today to get in touch with me, or I will present evidence publicly. And the reason why I made that threat is this, because Every time I try to bring these things up and effectively say, let's have a conversation, because the media don't want to listen to it, some within the media. Cricket South Africa certainly don't want to listen to it. No one wants to listen to it. And it's about bringing this up and say, can we delve into this matter? Can we talk about what really transpired? And that was the reason. Cricket South Africa also sent out a statement uh, where they said Cricket South Africa respond to attacks on the integrity of the match fixing investigation and allegations of unfairness and bias. Um, and they are said, I've got evidence of it. And the evidence was in relation to, to Horn and what was said, etc. I then received, I sent that tweet to the president of Cricket South Africa, Chris, Mr. Chris Nanzani, at 9.27. And I said, for your information, I tweeted this earlier, but we'll hold on to the information until you advise me further. He replied and he said, in fact, sorry, on this 06.48, the morning of the 8th, I said, good morning, Mr. President, breaking. New evidence came to light that will show that the investigation appeared to be biased. What do you want me to do with this? Regards, Alvira. He said, keep it until I advise you. Please protect it. I then said, that was at one minute past nine. At two minutes past nine, I said, okay, I will do so. And then at 9.27, I sent him a screenshot of the tweet where I said, breaking new evidence came to light. And then I'll give you until 10 o'clock. I said, for your information, I tweeted this earlier. But I will hold on to the information until you advise me further, because he said, please hold on to it until I advise you. He then replied and he said, better still, take that information to a police station for safekeeping so that it is available when required. To protect the integrity of the information, do not tell anyone at CSA, including me, where such has been deposited. So if Cricket South Africa then sends out a statement, which through their media manager, also on the 8th of October, um, he wrote to me and he said, I asked Louis to make contact with you because Louis Cole apparently sent out the statement. And he also said the chair of the transformation committee 
will get in touch with you. The chair of the Conservation Committee will contact you. CSA will issue a statement shortly inviting all new and additional evidence that may help in understanding what happened. And I think we must deal with this because it's important. It says CSA will issue a statement shortly inviting all new and additional evidence that may help in understanding what happened. But is that, is that true when it says, when the president tells me, better stop, take that information to a police station for safekeeping so that it is available when required to protect the integrity of the information, do not tell anyone at Cricket South Africa, including me, where such has been deposited. So don't tell Cricket South Africa, but the statement says, uh, we will invite, Cricket South Africa will invite all new evidence that came to light. That statement, in my opinion, is sent out almost to calm the waters so that people say, we've, we've sent out the statement, but there were no evidence. Because the president told me to not inform Cricket South Africa or anyone about the statement. This is the sort of stuff that we've been dealing with when it comes to Cricket South Africa. And, and this doesn't help the cause to get Cricket South Africa back where it should be. It certainly doesn't. Because where should, where should we go? I've made statements on Twitter where, I've tried to, where I was um, tried to be silent. I made statements. I, uh, I spoke to the president and I said, President, can you please look at this? I'm being told to hold on to information. Don't get that information with whoever. So what should we do? And then in my affidavit at 31, that's why I say that Cricket South Africa did not have the capacity to want to deal with this matter. I don't think they wanted to deal with this matter. And that's my reason for it. In 32, in conclusion, I said I've taken responsibility for my conduct. I've served my time despite my belief that other investigators would have come to a different conclusion and would have not charged me. Be that as it may, I do believe that the spreading of falsehood and interfering with my employment relationship with my employer, thereby hoping to tarnish my reputation and prejudicing me financially and professionally is a form of further sanctions against me as well as an attempt to silence me, which is unjustifiable and wrong. So as I understand, Mr. Peterson, the injustices that you are complaining about is that you were charged as if you were involved in the fixing, match fixing when in fact you were the one who told them about the match fixing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, accepted, I accepted responsibility for, for some <clears throat> meetings that I had with Bodhi that I didn't inform them immediately. I accepted responsibility for that and I yeah. accepted my sanction for that. Yeah. But I think it, yes. You are also saying even that sanction, according to you, it was too harsh because Absolutely. in instances where people agreed and even took money, but even if the fixing did not take place, those players were given six months. Yes, there was an intention to fix. Yeah. Where there's an intention to fix, an intention to have to, to commit a crime, they were given six months. <clears throat> and so you are referring... In my, in my case, it is a 
based on reporting. Give when years. you are referring to the, the incident that involved the late Hansi Kronier, right? Uh, Hansi Kronier, yes, in, in yes. similar incidents. Yeah. Yes. Then you say you were forced to enter. One of the injustices that you are mentioning is the fact that you were forced to enter into this settlement agreement. And the factors that you are mentioning is that you were refused postponement, you were refused information that you requested, and as a result, you had to make a decision at the point where the hearing would have continued without I you, was, yeah. I was granted the postponement. We were refused the information the information okay. that we requested, and 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 just just to give you some insight into the information that we requested, we requested firstly the full interview of what has happened, um, and also information in relation to why they charged me. And I think one of one of the things we requested was during my interview, the investigators put up a slide and um, showed, I think, names, etc. They showed it to me. My legal team wanted to see that because there were video recordings in that, in that interview. I wasn't granted that. I was given part of my interview, which they said, in fact said they will give, provide the full interview. Yeah. And, and, and as you would know, I had, to, I had to almost make a decision and say, is it best to, to accept the sanction? And after the two years, hopefully my story will go out there and people can judge for themselves. And that's all I wanted. I want people to judge for themselves. Because at the moment, if people look at Alvaro Peterson and everything that's in the media, they will say he was part of a match fixing scam which is which is completely untrue in terms of intention to fix matches intention to commit a crime etc and also for mr becker either through csa to inform journalists that i could be charged criminally is without merit there's absolutely no merit to it unless he unless he can come and come testify why there's merit that that will happen. But I'm telling you now, and I'm putting this under oath, that there's no merit for me being charged criminally for any activity in this match fixing scam. And, and in you, 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 that was that, said in order to tarnish your name. Absolutely. In order to tarnish my name, in order for um, journalists not to listen to me, and effectively, um, you know, if, if journalists don't listen to you and your name is being tarnished, people don't take what you say as fact. And I'm saying it again, I've said it before. In my opinion, fixing happened in the 2015 and 16 Ram Slam T20 competition. And you reported it before, before it happened. happened. Absolutely, without a doubt. And nothing was done? Nothing. Tell me, if something was done about that information, is it your view that, that the fixing would not have happened? What is it that they were supposed to do to stop the fixing from happening? Well, uh, so, so there's, a, there's a few things in this regard. Firstly, by own, on the Arsenal's own account, in September 2015, he reported. I reported in October. On the 4th of November, that is when uh, the supposed fix happened in that game. So from September to November, if the investigators knew exactly that fixing would take place, 
or there's something brewing, why didn't they put a stop to it? Why allow it to continue for a long period of time? Why allow the investigation to continue for a long period of time? You just have to pay lawyers. Cricket South Africa will have to pay lawyers and where it could have been, I think it could have been simple to stop the investigation. And I've told Louis Go on the 12th of October, all I want to happen is to stop. In fact, I told him, I said, I don't want my teammates to get into trouble. Just stop this, just stop it. It's in my affidavit, my, yeah. my, my first affidavit that I, that I put out. Because most of those players, and in particular, uh, Mr. Tami Tzolakile, who was a friend of mine. Um, he, he, pre he previously started his, his cricket career in the Western Cape. He then lost his contract and worked in the office, um, I think in the development offices, club cricket, etc. I called him up and I said, Tommy, would you like would you like to play professional cricket again? Because I think you're good enough. I brought him to the lion and he resurrected his career. So now with this match fixing thing, I saw everything fall to pieces. I went to Louis Cole and I said, Louis, just stop this. I don't want these guys to get into trouble. Just stop it. They allowed it to go on and on and on. I think the investigation could have been done better. And they, did, they but, did have capacity to stop it, not to happen. Absolutely. It's very, it's, it's simple. You could have stopped it. it it's as simple as phoning, phoning up someone, Gulam Bodhi, and saying, Gulam, we are aware of what's happening. Yeah. That's it. Could have done that in September. That do you think they stood to gain then by allowing it to continue? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I really don't know. There's, I mean, it, it will just be speculation. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I know. I know. After after doing research and you know digging a little bit deeper, I found out that um, David Becker and Tony Irish were in fact colleagues at Irish and McLeod, a law firm. I mentioned this to, to Tony Irish in an email correspondence I had with him. Soon after that, um, he removed himself from the website. The problem is I've got copies of that website where it shows that they were in fact colleagues. And I'm very happy to provide that information. Secondly, I know that David Becker and Harun Logat worked together at the ICC. And Harun Logat, um, in fact, in David Becker, um, when Harun had an issue with ICC, that David Becker stood up for him. I know that. And some would say, based on that, is it a situation where he was now given free reign to earn his legal fees and allow the investigation to run for years? I don't know. And I can't conclusively say that. But, I, I, I... but what, I do, what I do feel is that David Becker was given free reign to influence Cricket South Africa. Imagine. Sorry, Alvi, may I just interject? I just wanted to understand something about the relationship regarding um, CSA and the media or David Becker and the media. Um, in your testimony, or rather in your affidavit, um, in paragraph 16, you say that uh, David Becker has gone as far as informing some journalists and my employer, either directly or through CSA, that I will or could be criminally charged and um, 
you know, you further than just speak about how CSA appeared to give journalists and the media the impression that you could not be trusted and so forth. Um, I know uh, last week about three different testimonies from Dr. Eugenia, Prof. Odendahl and Prof. Richard Kelland spoke about how obviously the media is an important stakeholder, you know, within the cricketing system and that um, there were even allegations by Dr. Eugenia that, you know, um, on many occasions, you know, CSA would, you know, ab abuse media policies and so forth and also the reporting of the media in uh, about cricket, cricket news, you know, was sometimes biased. So I just want you to just expand on that, you know, um, in, in terms of, you know, what, what was happening at the time with the match fixing investigation and the relationship that the media and CSA or David Becker had at the time. So, so yes, you are correct that um, the media is an important stakeholder. Um, and during the investigation, I felt like the media had more, or, or there were certain things leaked to the media because they had accuracy in terms of what's actually happened within the investigation. And I feel that at times the, the media were used to either intimidate um, or tarnish reputations. And it's only some within the media. And I wanna go back to my statement on Twitter on the 20th of September, 2019, where and, and, and I quote again, I said, dear media, you failed to report and inform loyal cricket fans of the biggest sports corruption case in South Africa. What and who are you protecting? Criminal Gulambodi to be sentenced today in Pretoria Commercial Crime Court. And this is important. He and his mates fixed matches in South Africa. Now, if I make a statement like that, Surely media will get in touch with me and say, uh, what do you mean games were fixed when Cricket South Africa said they weren't? I never recall, I never got a call in terms of, please tell us about this. Now I'll go further, I'll go further. If those statements were not correct, wouldn't Cricket South Africa have sued me by now? Instead, what they do is they go around my back and try to influence my employment relationship. And I have nothing against Cricket South Africa because as I mentioned, I think most of them were kept in the dark in any event. That's why I have nothing against Cricket South Africa. What I want is I want us to be transparent. That's what I want. And I want the public to measure for themselves what has happened. Instead, on, 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 on social media and, and, and Twitter, etc., I'm being called a match fixer. I'm being called a cheat. Where evidence of that is not forthcoming. The only evidence is media articles that I read. Or I would, I would ask people, tell me why you call me a cheat give me some evidence. And then they send a media article that says, match fixer Alvaro Peterson sentenced to two years or whatever. You also mentioned that certain players were treated differently. You mentioned the Vaughn's case, who also reported in the same way that you did, without mentioning any names, who when you say investigation was biased and certain employee, uh, players were treated differently, what do you mean by that? Well, certainly in terms of the, the Juan Panyar spot case, mm -hmm. and, I, and I believe certain players were actually briefed by the investigation, by the, by the investigators. Um, and I think it, as, as you mentioned, I think it will be unfair to mention yeah. players' names at this stage because they active inter, international, he's an active international player. So I wouldn't want to do that, but I do question 
um, based on the evidence that I had that um, I think it was it was dealt with bias biasly. And I mean it's a it's an old age thing in cricket South Africa of how players are being treated. One example I can make and I would like to make is that in 2015 as well, um, when I played for the Lions, I then entered into a T20 league. Um, I think it was former International Players League, which was going to happen in Dubai. I entered into the league. I was bought for 29,000 US dollars to play in the league. I was denied to go play in that league. So to deny me to go play in that league is justifiable if I'm the only player from that team, from the Lions at the time, to go play in the league. But my teammate, Neil McKenzie, was allowed to go play in that league. So I lost out on over 400,000 rand and was told, no, you're going to stay here, you're going to play in the one-day competition. But my teammate, who was also at the end of his career, was allowed to go play in that league. And nothing happened. And these are the injustices that is happening in cricket South Africa and in cricket as a whole. And I don't think cricket South Africa is a bad organization. I think cricket South Africa must be transparent, they must be open. And that's all everyone asks. Let me ask you a direct, direct question. Is it your view that there, there might have been other white players who might have been involved in the same way that others were involved, the black players? who were not investigated, who were not part of the investigation? I'm, I'm sure that, so, so, so my information that I got, most of my information was through Tommy Tulakila, who have mentioned those names to me. And in my affidavit, he deals with them. Yeah. Uh, there are previous affidavit. Yes. Like I said, we don't have to mention the names. Yes. But yes. The affidavit that I mentioned, those names were mentioned. They were former international players as well um, and others. But I think the best person will be able to answer that would probably be Tommy Tolikida because I never had direct information from those players and others. What I did in terms of um, when I met with Gulam the first time, I did ask him, were the guys involved? Please tell me, you know, please mention the, and, and I mentioned some names that Tommy mentioned, but um, he didn't quite confirm. Yeah. Those were just from my side. Now, Mr. Peterson, given the, the processes that um, you have engaged in this entire saga. Um, I'm just struggling to hear you. Come yeah. again? I was just struggling to hear you. Oh, oh yes. Oh. Uh, maybe the mask <laughs> also masked my voice. Yeah. Now, I was saying, given the, the, the various engagements we have had with CSA uh, in pursuit of all these goings on that affected you, what would be your expectations from a process such as this SJN project? Well, for, for, me, it's, for me, it's more about the bigger picture. Um, I think it's important that we get cricket back on track. That's the important thing. And if we look at, a, at the personal 
cost of what this is um, meant for me, it is huge. You know, to to walk around and be called a criminal and be called um, a cheat, etc. It's firstly not not nice, and secondly, I don't think there's justification for that. But then again, the people that that are doing it, you can understand why they're doing it. Because there's a narrative in the media that was um, that is being perpetuated with this continuous thing of recruiting me with players who I know have accepted money in relation to this match fixing scam. Um, and I, I, I personally think that's wrong. Um, it, it had a direct influence on me, on possibly my employment uh, and future employment. And I wanted to set that record straight because that was always going to be my idea of really telling the public what has happened. And as you as you know, what I've, uh, there's so much more to this, so much more in detail stuff. Because simply we don't we don't have the time. I probably need the whole day to sit here or and the next and the next to really go into the detail of explaining exactly how complex the situation is. And all I wanted, I wanted the public to know what has happened. That's the important thing. And I want cricket to be on a better path. Because tomorrow the boy in Soweto or Galvindale or Kailitra or wherever that might be eight years old now, the same age I was back then in Port Elizabeth, now Kabecha. I want that boy to have confidence in the system, knowing that it's not about the color of his skin, but it's about what he can contribute as a human being, first of all. And secondly, what he can contribute in showing off his skill there without being discriminated against, purely because of where he comes from and what he looks like. We need to have that understanding that that's what we want to do. That's what cricket needs. Cricket doesn't need politics. Cricket don't need a media that compromise some people and support and lift others up. Cricket need honesty. Cricket need people that will, that will go out there and be united, because that's what sport does. It unites everyone. But it can't be a situation where it breaks us down. And that's what it is. I know where I come from. I come from a family, single mom, that lived in a garage. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Peterson. Um, I was asking the question because um, some of your colleagues had begun to say, what is it going to help, you know, coming to your process? Because we've been there before, or even if it was not us, you know, but some people have probed into, into cricket in the past. Some of them were judges. They mentioned Judge Nicholson the, and, and all the other judges who have been involved with um, looking at the, at cricket for the last 30 years because people had had their hopes raised when, in 1991, cricket was united. There was no longer, in the view of many people, going to be a sporting cricket, a sporting coat named cricket being for cowards, for black people, for whites, for Indians. We are now going to have one cricket. 
and that cricket would be non-discriminatory on any basis, especially on racial bases. But it looks like um, this project would, has had to be put um, on the road because there were people like you who would be prepared to come and say, no, uh -uh. not everything is as it should be. Not everything is as it looks like it is. There is so much to this than meets the eye. And the only way to do it is to confront it head on, speak the truth about where things are at, and hopefully to get those, you know, about whom certain things are said, to realize that there is, as you say, the, there is no politicking that is aimed at. Uh, what is aimed at is to, you know, is to dialogue, to get into a conversation at the end of which everyone will feel that we are who we want to be. We, the people of South Africa, of all races, of all colors and creeds, want to have one country to play one sport uh, in the sense that, you know, a sporting code like cricket should not be a divider but be a unifier. It seems to me, therefore, that it is a, it's something that we should do and uh, we are doing so. To, uh, to encourage people like you to come forward and, um, and let us have the benefit of your own pain. Uh, and hopefully be able to speak to the powers that be um, for remedial action. But even if we don't go that far, it seems to me creating a platform such as this one has assisted, and I hope it has assisted you and others to have a place where they can feel that they are being listened to. Because it's one thing to go to those who are in the levers of power and talking to them. And you get out of that conversation feeling that you were not being listened to. Or even if people were listening, they were not hearing you. Uh, and I would hope that we, we have not only listened to you, we have heard you, and, um, and that we would be able to convey to Cricket South Africa, you know, the essence of what your, your genuine feelings are. Cricket must be right. Cricket must be a sporting code that accepts everyone, your children, somebody else's children, my children, irrespective of our colors or creeds. So I thank you very much for, for having availed yourself to come and, and speak to us. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, just also from my side, I want to I wanna thank you guys for the opportunity to, to share my story. Um, uh, and I also want to thank Cricket South Africa, um, and in particular, Dr. Eugenia, for, for, for setting this up. I know, you know, she takes a lot of flack um, from media and people that didn't want this process to, con to continue or to happen. Um, yeah. but, but it is indeed an opportunity for, for people to engage publicly so that the public know what, what has happened. And those players, um, particularly the players at the Lions who know will know that I fought the system, but I fought for them as well. Um, and it wasn't about being popular, but it was about 
following my heart and understanding um, where people come from, you know, and, and their backgrounds and their journeys. And, and that led us to, to play eight players of color at a time where people said, are you mad? Are you crazy? You, you lose. You can't do this. But we ended up being very successful. We ended up playing three Champions Leagues in four years. We ended up winning trophies. We ended up producing pro tier players. And I'm proud about that. Um, and, and I think Mr. Chris Nenzani, the president, has made mention of that, that specific period um, at Lions Cricket where we actually played eight players of color more than what we, the stipulated amount was. Um, and yet we won trophies and we produced players. But in terms of other players coming forward and giving their version and openly sharing, I think there might be a situation where some will not come forward, unfortunately. And the reason for that is um, there, there might be lots of reasons. One, to protect the income, to protect the jobs within cricket, and that they're not prepared um, to be scrutinized. And to those guys who are prepared to come up and say, this is my experience, I believe history will judge us and it will judge us fairly. And that is important. At some way in the future, hopefully we could have made a small difference. And then lastly, Cricket South Africa, because ultimately, the Board of Cricket South Africa and the leaders of Cricket South Africa will have to decide if they want to implement any recommendations that you and others will give them. In the past, the Nicholson report, clearly it wasn't implemented. And I hope this time around, they will have the courage to implement these things. And lastly, to the media, all we ask for is fairness. Treat us fair. Treat everyone fair. And that's the important thing. We need to get, get cricket back on track. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks very much, Mr. Peterson. Well, we are just about at 12.25. Um, we should have taken a lunch hour between 12 and 1 o'clock. May I propose that we adjourn and take the one hour for lunch and that we resume the proceedings at half past one, 1330. We are adjourned. Thanks very much, Mr. Peterson.